Welcome back to the GEHNC podcast, and this is also the first debut episode of the Integral Cinema podcast with my good friend Mark Allen Kaplan, the creator of the Integral Cinema project and a brilliant researcher, filmmaker, and theorist. I recently just made a film with him called Integral Goes to the Movies, which is based on his talk at the Bay Area Integral, which I urge you to check out on YouTube. And here we wanted to talk a little bit about the process of making Integral Goes to the Movies, meaning of taking his talk and turning it into this thing with almost 100 film clips and dozens and dozens of animations and charts and things like that. So kind of creating that and yes. uh, creating that work. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Jonathan. Congratulations uh, you. on your debut podcast, my friend. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your hard work on this video, man. You know, amazing work. Why, thank Check you. Check it out. Um, and uh, so the Integral Cinema Project is a research, production, and educational initiative. And we're exploring the application of integral structures of consciousness mm -hmm. towards um, cinema, towards the cinematic practice. Um, and we'll talk about integral structures of consciousness many times, but basically we all develop through different stages and different structures as individuals and societies. One of the levels is integral. That's kind of near the top. Near the top of we what's started. happening now. Right, it goes archaic, yeah. magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, and then integral, and then there's a few above that, but... Yeah. And we talk about them in Integral Goes to the Movies, which is why I recommend watching that. Yes. But what we're really talking about here is one of the processes that we've developed at the Integral Cinema Project is what we're calling right now Integral Cinematic Meta Design. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you are the Integral Cinematic Meta Designer on Integral Goes to the Movies, this yes. video we're talking about. Yes. I was the director and editor, but he was the designer. Designer. And what does that mean? What does that mean? Well, a lot of filmmakers will pre design their films. You know, Alfred Hitchcock and Stanley Kubrick are classic examples. They would storyboard every frame, uh, every shot. They would, you know, really precise. And they come from a tradition of understanding how all the different expressive elements of the cinema, of the moving image, affect us psychologically, emotionally, perceptually, even physically. So there's like a whole tradition in, in, um, in um, movie making about how to design a cinematic work for a specific outcome. Now usually these outcomes are for propaganda films, you know, like how to convince people of a certain issue or something like right. that. Uh, they're used in commercials to right. sell you a product. Thrillers. Thrillers. Make they're you thrilled. You know, to give you, you know, um, horror, to give you suspense. You know, like one of the outcomes is we want to create suspense here. And, you know, mm -hmm. so all, you know, so m most of the things you're experiencing in a film is usually designed that way or it's accidentally done that way or intuitively done that way. Mm -hmm. Some filmmakers, like Robert Altman, wouldn't design anything and they would just create, you know, on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, and that has its own organic stuff, too. But what we're talking about here is meta design, going beyond that. We're talking about using it for all the dimensions of the cinematic work in relation to us, in relation to the um, um, viewer to see if we could actually induce states of consciousness and shift structures of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So th this is more than just creating suspense or creating an emotional experience. This is about um, healing, personal growth, transformation. Um, if a filmmaker wants to create a film, it's like, for example, if you want to create a film about um, global warming and you want to you know like put up front you know like try to get people who are not into it who don't understand it to think about it you using this design we could actually look at the structures of consciousness that are at the cusp of understanding it but can't and then we could design it so that we could take we could help those people who are on the cusp between, between the stage before, um, um, the stage we're talking about is pluralistic. 
pluralistic stage of development, which was before integral. Um, but after rational. And after <laughs> rational. After mythic rational. Mythic rational and all that. And magic mythic rational. Right. Um, but basically, pluralistic is the first stage where we can actually deeply understand and perceive interconnectedness. And the rational stage before can't quite grok it. Okay. So and it's all about taking things apart. Yes. You know, and, uh, the rational stage yes. is all about measuring everything. Measuring. And when things uh, you know, get together, there's a synergy that's hard to measure. Right. <laughs> but, and also, non local connections are very hard for that structure of consciousness. Mm -hmm. But what would be an example of a non local connection, like outside of the outside of parapsychology and quantum mechanics of what's an example of a non-local for example the there? rational I mean it's like for example our economic <laughs> system it it does not actually include a lot of non-local costs because the rational mind does not perceive them as being valid for economic um, structure so for example you know a company that uses roads and fire departments and police departments, all of those are, are non-local costs Right. that the current economic system does not take into account. Right. So that's important, I thought, to make that point, because I was just hearing, actually, Antonopoulos, I can't remember his first name, who's a Bitcoin evangelist, was talking about this in the context that our current banking system is great as long as you're willing to accept 4 billion people in poverty who can't use the financial system because it requires identity, papers, please, and all of that. And those are the examples, I guess, of... That's the interconnectedness that, that you can't you really see. Yeah. That interconnectedness. Yeah, and so yeah. pluralism is you suddenly sense that to yeah. solve global problems, climate right. change. You need to sense the interconnectedness of everything. So if I want to make a film that actually changes people's minds who are not at pluralistic, then I would need to design it to meet people where they're at and bring them over. Right. And that's where the integral cinematic meta design comes in. We could actually, we basically extrapolate that structure of consciousness where the viewer is at and, and design the text, image, sound, and temporal structuring of the editing mm -hmm. um, to kind of move people from there to there. So, now, this does sound kind of sinister. I mean, couldn't people use it? go backwards as well, or I guess they already do. It could use it to go backward, and the, and the trick here is that if someone isn't ready, there's nothing you could do that's going to change them. Right. This is for the audience members who are actually on the cusp, mm -hmm. who are actually heading there anyways. Right. And a cinematic experience could actually give them that last jump they need. Right. But they're already on the way. So it's, it doesn't work with people who are not primed. Right. So you can't really, um, it's kind of, you can't really engineer society's consciousness that strictly. You know, right. Cause, because first of all, you can't skip a stage. You have to go through each stage of development. You can't like mm -hmm. hop from one to the other without serious repercussions. Right. So you can't go from magical to pluralistic. Right. Or from tribal to pluralistic. Yeah. And if, to understand what he just said, you have to watch the video. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a jump. Too many jumps. Yeah. You can't make too many jumps. You have to go through all the stages. One by one. So we can't take someone at mythic um, and get them to pluralistic. But what we can do is we could frame the debate on, on global warming in, in, in mythic terms so that some people at mythic who are at the borderline of mythic rational may be able to kind of hold it from their perspective. Mm -hmm. so, all about, so it's like once we know the different structures of consciousness and how, um, how film communicates it and We've done, uh, the Integral Cinema Project, we've done years of research on, well, not every film ever made, but we basically have, uh, have analyzed, for example, every financially successful film all of all time. The top the you AFI know, Top 100? The AFI Top 100, uh, The Hollywood Reporter, um, 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 top 100. a variety. 
the films who have won the Cannes Film Festival. So Reporter and Variety, what was this, the best reviewed or? The... Uh, all time. They had an all time list. Oh, their all time list. Their all time list. Which we also have the all time like... list from the Village Voice. We want to ah. make sure we get, you know. The critics. And, and from well the British the... Film Institute so, and from Cannes. So, you know, so, so we're going around the world. all these different banks of films. And right, so different banks of films and we've found a lot of very clear patterns of how structures of consciousness are embedded and communicated and how different elements communicate with us in profound ways and also that um, that financially successful films will actually have very similar patterns in, in certain um, uh, um, domains. So like for example, um, a financially successful film will have a high resonance v um, um, value. Resonance value. Resonance. So it resonates deeply with culture and society and How do you measure individuals. that? How do you measure that value? Hmm? How do you measure that value, the resonance value? We measure it by, there's several d different metrics here. One of them for the resonance is the structures of consciousness in the film. Or, or video game or VR thing, and in the audience. Mm -hmm. So let's say that a film like Avatar actually has all major structures of consciousness. That would give it a very high um, mm -hmm. resonance um, value because it's communicating across all those different audiences. Audience, different audiences. And, but it's doing it masterfully. <laughs> You beautifully have the tribal, you have the, mag the magical tribal, you have the mythic military warriors, that structure of consciousness. You have the rational business person, it's all about the money. And it's integrating them, it's synthesizing them, it doesn't feel like it's ad hoc, it's like, so all of that connects with the resonance value. Mm -hmm. And there's also, a, in, in the resonance, there's also a um, kind of a um, mysterious quantifier here, which is the um, zeitgeist. We have a way of actually measuring the zeitgeist or tapping into it. Oh, really? We've de been developing a, a database that actually has the, the interrelationship between the evolution of the moving image, consciousness, culture, and society, tracking from the beginning. And we're, we're seeing these patterns, and we could actually get a sense of the movement of all those forces. And the parallels, presumably. And the parallels between, the between those forces. Of consciousness in the society and the evolution of the cinematic consciousness, yes. or the visual consciousness. Yes, so you're getting basically, and then up to this moment where we're measuring a work, we could actually um, more accurately. Um, uh, attuned to the current zeitgeist because we're measuring the flow of the zeitgeist up until this moment. And how do you measure the zeitgeist? That seems like a very... Measuring the zeitgeist is what we were doing. That if you look at the, for example, let's take Star Wars. The zeitgeist when Star, the first Star Wars or the fourth one yeah, 1977. The 1977 Star Wars. Star Wars that the first, first Star one. Wars. The first good one. <laughs> <laughs> That's for another podcast. <laughs> a coming podcast. All right, let's take Star Wars. All right, so this was a breakout hit. Every studio turned it down at least once. Some turned it down twice. Mm -hmm. They all said it's not going to work because at that time, no science fiction film has <laughs> had been a big hit. It had no bankable talent. Right? Science fiction was a B genre. It was really. a B genre at that time. Mm -hmm. No bankable talent. Uh, so it didn't have the standard measures. It failed at all the standard measures. Okay? But what it didn't fail at was a pure, perfect attunement with, that, with the zeitgeist. Now, the, that's the, kind of obvious in retrospect. In so retrospect. So but how can see, this say, is the key. Uh, what we've been studying is that. Yeah. Is how, through the history of the moving image, what was the zeitgeist? What was the connections between culture and society and, and movements? And you start seeing these patterns. So you can kind of predict why Rocky uh, was a success when it was, why Gone with the Wind was a success when right. it was. Right. Like you could predict that 
in terms of its internal stuff, like how many structures of consciousness and all that. But you could also predict it with what what is the atmosphere, the zeitgeist of the times, and how is it playing into it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and just to sum it up real quick, for Star Wars, at that moment, the moving image mediums, television and film at that time and all that, had killed archetypes and myth. There was no more um, mythic heroes, we, you know. Um, and there was a good reason we killed them, you know, because they were kind of cardboard and, you know, and they no longer kind of were, were sustainable. Mm -hmm. And after the 60s and, you know, and early 70s, you know, the big thrust into pluralistic and, and so it's all of these things were important factors. The age of the counter myth. The age of the counter myth. And all of that, we needed that. But at that moment, there was a vacuum. We had no archetypes. We had no myths. And mythic storytelling and archetypes are actually deeply rooted in our being. And we yearn for them if we don't have them. So what he did is he reimagined them, but for the pluralistic rational realm. Okay. He encased them in science fiction. Okay. Um, so it was, you Although know. Although it's a pretty mythic film, really. It's a very mythic film, film, but... It's set in the future, in the past, at, at the same time, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right. so it's this it's... mythic storytelling opening. It's saying a long, long time ago, but actually when we're watching it, it looks like our future. Right. The way the so, technology. So it's a brilliant use of skipping over the current vacuum. Uh, it's like taking... Reimagining the archetypes for the future, a great example of this, very subtle one, is what we call, um, um, is called um, synthesized innovation, Blasted. the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant... The lightsaber is brilliant, for sure. It's brilliant. It's a now, samurai what is, sword. So here you're taking a classic <laughs> mythic tool. You know, for the warrior, the saber, the sword, mm -hmm. okay? And you're putting it into the future. You're, you're making a science, you know, you're, you know. And, and you're recreating the, uh, the samurai class, which right. is what Jedis are. But, Jedi but are. in a way, you're not Jedis. going backwards. You're going forward with it, okay? Because it's not a, just a copy. It's a, a synthesis beyond it. Mm -hmm. it's, it. It's innovative. It's not just derivative. Mm-hmm. And it's the way it's done, you know, the way the sound is with it, the way it's, you know, the way it's used, and how it's, you know, it's all kind of this reimagining of myth and archetype. And that was the vacuum it was in, and that's why it went wild. It exploded. Yeah. Because it touched this yearning. Right. So you can look at all the kind of hit films and see why they were... Why, why they, they hit, hit what, what, what was happening in the zeitgeist. Right. It's funny, actually. I was just thinking, I want, we want to get back to the uh, integral goals of the movies and our process for making that, which was integral, but obviously we were a little limited. But I was just thinking about Gone with the Wind when we were talking about it, which was a big hit. And the current view now is the pluralistic view, which looks back and says, that film seems kind of racist because it shows these kind of happy slaves. It shows us the whole view of it is sort of a white supremacist view. But at the same time, it's actually quite pluralistic yeah, in that the black characters, especially um, Hattie McDaniel's character, I don't remember if she's Mammy, she's Mammy, the other one's Chrissy, but uh, Hattie McDaniel's character is actually smarter and wiser than Scarlett O'Hara is throughout the whole film. So in a way, it's a subversive film for the time because it's depicting a black person as a human being who's capable of intelligence and independent thought and all these kinds of things that really weren't that common in 1939 in the cinema, I don't think. I mean, maybe I'm certainly not in that kind of scale. I mean, well, that must have been... And she won an Academy Award because the Academy yeah. was like, oh, wow, we want to honor this black person for yeah. playing a real person. <laughs> well, that, that, that was an important part of it. There was, with uh, Gone with the Wind, there was a lot of things going on there. A lot of things going on there. Remember, this is 1939. Right. This is... There was war looming on the horizon. Okay. And it's interesting, 1939 is considered by many the great. historians to be like the best year in Hollywood history. 
because you've yep. got like classic I mean, year. I mean, classic year. You tons know, tons and tons of the Wizard of Oz, Gone films. with the Wind. I mean, it's just you know, yeah, it goes I on and on. All the list, but you know, I used to know that list. <laughs> right. So what was going on here? You know, what was going on? And one of the interesting things to look at is if you take all those classic great films from 1939 and look at them from a cultural and social perspective, what was going on in, in the world and all that, it's really creepy because all of these films taken as a whole can really be held and seen as they were preparing our consciousness for the coming war. Really? There was different dimensions of it that each film had. Oh, now I have to go back and look at that it's list. very fascinating sure how it's almost like the zeitgeist was preparing us, you know? Yep. And Gone with the Wind was part of that. So we can't really, we'll have to have that for a, another podcast because that's, that's a big story. We can't just talk about Gone with the Wind here because it was right, part of this. we have to do a 1939 podcast. <laughs> yeah, it was part of this whole kind of interesting kind of, um, this kind of really kind of, mass synchronization of cinematic consciousness preparing us for what was about to come. Really? Very fascinating. I can't remember all the other ones. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be up to me anyway. So we'll have to look them up. Yeah. <laughs> Google 1939 greatest year. I'm sure you'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. So now this video, so um, this video. goes to the movies, my talk at Bay Area Integral. Yep. Um, we just shot it, one camera from the side. We were just kind of saying we just might throw it up online and we needed to get a recording of it anyway for them and didn't really have a plan to turn this into what we turned it into no. when we started. <laughs> and we just started by, you know, well, we should probably put in a few clips and, and, and maybe some of the slides too. And it just snowballed. It um, snowballed. I started looking at places where I thought, a lot of the teachings could be visually clearer, and so I, did we start designing all these color charts and even animating them so that every, as he spoke, there would be a visual to anchor people. So yeah. That was one of the things, yeah. just anchoring people in the structures of consciousness. Yeah. And that's, very, that's, a, that's a, 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 a wonderful, in, um, in integral um, cinematic meta design, I know it's a big mouthful, um, we kind of, we have different levels of engagement, immersion, engagement, participation. You, know, you, you could use all those phrases. And what you're talking about there is creating these charts and animation, talking about creating a cognitive and perceptual engagement mm -hmm. so that it, when I'm saying an idea or a concept, a concept is up here and all that, if you combine that with a visual um, representation and animate it, moving it, it creates this um, this cognitive perceptual immersion field mm -hmm. that it's not just verbal. You're, one of the things is um, what we use is um, Sergei Eisenstein's notion of synchronization of the senses. So what that means is that the main communication domains of the moving image is text, image, sound, and time. The time being the accumulated meaning patterns created by the succession of shots or, or, or movement. Okay. And so when you harmonize those together, the more sensory inputs you have in unison and serving the same idea towards a common purpose. Towards a common purpose, the more powerful it is, the more that the more it enters us in a more embodied way. Like when we absorb information, we can get it up here, you know, and if we hear a great quote, you go, wow, that's great, you know, but it can only be up here. We may not actually feel it in our being and actually be able to act out of it. Mm -hmm. that, that is what we call embodied learning, you know, and the body learning is multi-dimensional, multi-sensorial. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when I'm talking in the video, if I'm saying a certain thing, like, for example, there's a section where I'm talking about how in integral films there tends to be a, a, um, a synthesis of the, uh, of the masculine, feminine, or agency in communion. Right. And we use the example from Source Code. Yep. It was a great shot. Tell me everything's going to be okay. 
Everything's gonna be okay. So I'm saying it, I'm saying this idea, and then we have this shot that actually emotionally and viscerally communicates what I'm saying. So now you've got, and you're doing it um, visually. The text is me. I'm saying the text. Right. But that idea and that a vision... guy film can also have communion in it, so it can have the masculine and feminine elements. Even the agency if it's and communion, a guy film. action and character, all that. Yep. You know, so that's kind of like a, that is the visceral, emotional participation. Whereas the charts, mm -hmm. they're cognitive and perceptual participation. Right. But it takes it deeper cognitively. Like when I'm just talking to you and saying something, and I'm, even if you're watching me right now, and I tell you, you know, that, um, you know, that uh, a pluralistic um, pers perception of truth is that everything is relative. And then we show you a clip, the one from Manning Hall. Right, a great, great clip. <laughs> um, really illuminates yeah. but before you know, we show you that clip if i'm just sitting here and saying to you the pluralistic um structure of consciousness a film that's pluralistic will have a relativistic um, uh, um truth, truth pattern. pattern what does that mean to you and it's up here right yep right now if i show you a chart of it it goes deeper in cognitively and perceptually, it, it, it starts to, it ignites your visual internal field, mm -hmm. not just your thoughts, but your visual internal field, your imagination. So that makes it even more embedded in you, or it, 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 you, could, you could feel it more. And then if you have the, a, a clip that we do. How often do you sleep together? Do you have sex often? Hardly ever, maybe three times a week. Constantly, I'd say three times a week. And you experience it. You're, you're getting a visual and auditory and temporal experience right. of it. Now you've got, you've got a lot of different senses communicating this idea at the same time to you. Now, in our talk, we weren't able to do this process fully because the clips we're showing are from other films. We didn't design them from scratch. Right. So this is a rudimentary um, example. Of cinematic meta design. Yeah, yeah of cinematic meta design. Integral yeah. cinematic meta design. Yeah. Because we were limited by you know, right. that what we, we had didn't create with. everything. <laughs> right. But there was some great moments where, you know, you get kind of that deep resonance. Oh, yeah. We, we were both really fond of the Inception one because that we were talking about how structures of consciousness can actually be represented, in this case, in the case of the movie Inception, in the levels of a dream. And each level, as you go deeper, is a lower structure of consciousness. Yeah. And when we put them together, structure. when we put them in a row, you experience it. You, you viscerally really it. experience the different structures. You see things like, for example, in the archaic level, it's the dream level in, in, in deep limbo, where it's like the characters are hardly conscious. They can hardly function. When they get to the magic level, they can create worlds. They create anything they want. They build worlds and destroy worlds. And it's magical. Then at the um, um, mythic level, they're tasked with attacking a fortress. Mythic. At the rational level, they're moving through a maze of corridors in a modern hotel in, in the dream world. In the pluralistic level, it's always about there's all these various people around the people who are dreaming and they represent different aspects of their psyche. So you have the pluralistic dimension of the psyche. And then the integral is the waking state where you can see it all. So. And we did the same thing with Groundhog Day. Right, where you see his, you know. in that one, it's not really avant-garde, it's just yep. his character goes through the evolution. From right, the circles of care and concern, you know, which is part of, part of the structures of, of consciousness. The structures of consciousness, um, they're levels of development and that they can be tracked and connected across multiple lines of development. 
um, a personal development would be circles of care and concern. You know, I, I evolved from egocentric to ethnocentric to relationships to sociocentric, the greater society, you know, to world centric, you know, that. And then, uh, and then my culture evolves. Um, those stages in a similar way and those stages are actually what we were talking about archaic and magic mythic right um, rational pluralistic and integral and they're parallel to these circles of care and concern another parallel is in the systems domain and it's parallel to technologies and economic structures so for example pluralism is connected to the information age and rational st structure industrial age. is connected to the industrial age. Yep. So you can see, and actually, often our technologies will help us evolve to these higher cultural so the levels iPhone, and personal sure, levels, as you too. Said. Yep, the iPhone is a convergence device. Right. It's a different consciousness to use an iPhone than to use a, a phone and even a computer. Right. So an iPhone is a convergence, an integral convergence device that is bringing us slowly towards integral. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so. Um, basically, the, the charts, going back to the charts, yep. right? the beautiful thing about animating the charts and creating a, a unified design, this is, I mean, uh, um, some viewers out there who are familiar with, with cinematic expression, the classic cinematic expression would go, oh, that's normal. And it's true. A lot of what we do with meta cinematic um, uh, with cinematic meta design, sorry, with integral cinematic meta design, is we take a lot of the classic traditional approaches and put them together and meld them with domains and measures and 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 kind of um, f fields um, from recent research on consciousness. On, on developmental psychology, all these new, you know, things that that add these multiple dimensions and the meta level, mm -hmm. and we have a way of integrating them because the word integral comes from integral theory, and this integral structure of consciousness we're doing, the approach we're trying to integrate as many dimensions and domains as possible, mm -hmm. and so while the um, the cl the design approach of animating something of doing the color scheme right. you know the, say, my thinking, thing was all about concretizing things concretizing so making them things. concrete so you yeah. would say we have structures of consciousness but if we could come up with a visual design yes. so they'd have something to anchor it more in the rational as you say yes but it has to be anchored in the rational before you can then start to grapple with it on the other levels absolutely you have to understand it so yes. that was my yeah. but also I tend to be a rational thinker so maybe that's my this is a great <laughs> example though using the term concretize mm -hmm. and how we're holding it is the difference this is the meta level mm -hmm. see when we're with the meta level we're looking at these expressive domains expressive elements and how to use them from a different perspective and this integrating perspective is about so when we're using the word concretize what we're talking about actually we're, we're working with these classic design elements and holding them from the structures of consciousness perspective yep for sure so what you just said right there was a perfect example of Correct. how we're holding these we traditional design tools mm -hmm. in a different way right so we're concretizing. So if we're concretizing a, a dimension of experience and, and relating that to a structure of consciousness, so we're concretizing this idea, this rational idea, this logical idea, and we're visualizing it, and we're concretizing it, we're animating it, we are basically creating a lived experience within that structure of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right, so like that example of the Annie Hall clip, you really viscerally feel that relative truth isn't just a concept, it's the real thing between men and women, that we have a relative yeah. truth, and that's kind of the nature. Well, not just men and women, between everyone, you know, right, exactly. the accident, like 10 people see that's an accident, there's that, 10 accidents. Right, it's that Rashomon story, yeah. but as you say, we use Rashomon, the most famous example of a pluralistic film, as an example of what integral isn't, that integral isn't actually pluralistic, yeah. that... It says there are many different worldviews, but it's possible to 
step above that a little bit and see that some worldviews may have more truth than others in certain domains. Yes. Or in that, certain perspectival fields, as you said. That's that. right. That's right. So that's a great example of two things, of, of that, that, um, that the relative truth is what's at pluralistic and, and that Rashomon and the Annie Hall one is a classic example of that, mm -hmm. but that integral is different. It's, it accepts that every, domain, every level has their own truths and they're valid at those levels. But it understands it. It, quant it qualifies truth. Mm -hmm. You know that yes, this is true at this level for this domain, but it's not true at this level for that domain. Or it's right. less. It has a like some truths have a greater um, field of, of of what they're covering. Right. Some is more limited truth. Some is more right. expansive. Right. This truth. actually kind of gets us to the really key point about all of this, which is that helping people to move up the structures of consciousness is kind of essential for the survival of the human species because we have now problems that can't be solved by mythic rational thinking. Yes. They can't be solved unless you move up that more encompassing domain of consciousness and that's where we're moving. We seem to be moving that way because of the internet and connections and it's on artists to help help people move those up those domains rather than moving down. You if know? you look at the evolution of the moving image and all its forms, we are moving that way. If you, I mean, it is naturally happening. The problem is, or the impetus now is that we are we're at a point where we could be potentially in an end game situation. So we may not have all the time in the world to make it. So if we could actually help it along by us media creators, if we can be more conscious of how these structures of consciousness work in our works and our moving image works, and if we become um, healers of the spiral of development, that we're creating works that are here to help us evolve, you know, help each stage of development evolve, you know, and like for example, if there's like um, a g g gap between two stages, how can we help that, you know, and stuff like that? Because realizing every problem we have, every single one, is actually a problem of consciousness. It's what it, every problem. Mm -hmm. there, we have enough food to feed everyone on the planet. Okay? We could house everyone on the planet if we wanted to. We have the technologies to live without destroying our environment. It's, you know, a problem of consciousness. It's, you know, being able to perceive it. See, we also have to not realize, not demonize those people who don't see it. Because if they're not at a structure of consciousness that can perceive interconnectedness, for example, it's right. They just can't. It's just not there. Right. You know, oh yeah, the emperor has no clothes doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily a moral statement on the emperor. It's more just about our inability to see what is in front of us because various things keep us from seeing them. Yeah, and each stage of development, even integral, has its its blinders. As we go through a, an evolutionary stage, as a developmental stage, it's um, it that stage of development it has some incredible b b blessings it has done and it has done some great healing from some of the problems that were created from the previous stage but then the next stage will create new problems and then we will end up having to transcend those those become our next problems so it's you know every stage has its blessings and then its challenges that we have to overcome right. for the next one. But there's no way backwards. There's no way out by going backwards. We could try. <laughs> we could try and we often do. We often do. I mean that's happening in this political this political season. We're still seeing the mythic rational rising up with people who aren't ready to realize that pluralistic is the way forward, not more division but less. But people are get afraid at these times and you know they'll you know, um, sometimes for legitimate reasons. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and um, there's often security. we are we're often given a choice of growing into the unknown, <laughs> growing into a new way, or falling back into what feels safer to us. Ooh. And the problem is, is that's not really, <laughs> it's not safe, really safe at all. Yeah.
You know, right. it's like right now, for example, to go back to mythic and um, um, represented by Donald Trump right now in terms of how he's portraying himself mm -hmm. and, and, the, and that field that's going around him, it's basically part of the draw is that going back into that older structure that will take care of me, that, you know, there'll be one powerful person, you know, who can handle things, who take care of things, you know, he knows, you know, you know, it's that, you know. It's also a misdirection structure. People at that level are easier to misdirect because they'll believe more black and white things. Yeah, so yeah. They're more, you know. Muslims, we have to keep all, every single Muslim out of the country. So that kind of casual bigotry and racism is really interesting, you know, coming out now. Yeah. But. There's but when you understand like the structures of consciousness, you you see it from this whole another perspective, right? And you realize, you know, it's it's it is we're basically dealing with a more complex situation than just you know trying to convince each other, right? Well, of, that's one know, of the reasons. Of, of you're right, I'm wrong. This is right. Like, one of the reasons I'm always interested in this work, especially, is because I'm interested in reaching people with different structures of consciousness. Because, as you know as well as I do, for instance the liberal echo chamber people talk about is often just people yelling at one another who are already on the same side and it's putting more division between them and people who are not on their side and that goes on on both sides Absolutely. the right and the left yeah, both, both send all this hate and there's not a lot of people trying to like figure out because i think the truth is that a lot of people are in the middle on a lot of issues and some people are much farther to the left or to the right on other issues than they want to admit and the whole system is designed to keep people confused and not seeing clearly and when you understand the structures of consciousness you can begin to see them in yourself and in your own beliefs yeah. and but but a, a very powerful force here is media mm -hmm. especially moving image media um, a lot of what we're seeing now in this election we could actually track back to the last eight years of media attention mm -hmm. and how the media was handling the political life of our country right the, but while the, simultaneous with that, though, was the development of people's consciousness because of the Internet, even the last eight years, yes. completely different world. There's a plurality of young people now yes. who no longer So there is, we have these media. forces, we have these mixed forces going on. You have media that was trying to, um, well, for example, you have conservative media that was trying to... Um, fan the flames of the um, uh, magic mythic and use that as like its its power source you know mm -hmm. and it's gotten out of control they like lit the fire and now it's right. burning <laughs> you know it's well, they weren't as powerful as they thought they were or they were more powerful than they thought they were. well no because they unleashed it and they're they're not in control of it anymore yeah, so yeah. they actually didn't have much power they just had enough power to start a fire but not enough power to actually use it yeah they but, didn't have enough consciousness to understand what they were doing <laughs> so you know and um even the um and on the liberal side it's well, like there's no liberal side let's be honest <laughs> well like for example msnbc kind of had the the persona of a liberal right. media organization, they were actually kind of mostly reacting to the conservative media. So they were caught in the pole, the polarity, and they actually helped to feed the cycle because <laughs> they, you know, they created the black and white, you know, energy that the mythic feeds off of. So it's really right. interesting. Anyway, so but also but, they're both establishment media. Ultimately, yes, they're both owned yeah. and run by large. But Marvel at the same time, we have in, uh, um, internet and and individuals Free who speech. are are shooting media with their phones and you know stuff like that. So that if we could democratize these ideas that we're talking about here. If we can get enough people out there to understand this and be able to use that, we're not just talking about filmmakers here. We're filmmakers. We're all of us now. We have a phone. You know, we could, you know. But everyone's a creator. Everyone's a creator in now. In some way. So to understand this, we can change the world. We can change consciousness. And a lot of it has to do with the, um, the media that we consume. 
because it's all around us. It's everywhere. It's on our phones. It's on our. It's on the billboards. It's you know. It's very hard to explain to people about that. It's, though. it's very Especially and it's very powerful. Consume media. It's very powerful. As, as I talk about in the talk, and we showed that you know. There is a film, uh, Triumph of the Will, yep. that his, many historians actually believe this, this one film helped Hitler come to power. Right. That without that film, he would not have come to power. So, it, Yeah, I mean, it's a different time now. I think the good news is that people are way more visually literate than they ever were. Absolutely. For sure, because the amount of media they consume and the amount of, uh, of this is bullshit media consume, they consume, you know, media that actually calls things out that are bullshit, that are bullshit. And so now everybody kind of knows that. But I have to say, you know, um, if, if you look at this talk, um, you'll see that the evolution of consciousness um, and the evolution of cinematic consciousness, there is this organic growth towards good. There's this growth towards, it's, it's like you could feel that uh, there's an evolutionary impulse within what we're doing, in spite of ourselves, that are pushing us, that are, are pushing us towards these higher le levels. And if we can, if we could join that and consciously work with that and work it, we could um, speed up the process even more and kind of save the world, you know. That's what we're aiming for. That's what we're aiming for, man. Well, that seems like a good place to wrap this up. Us Sounds saving good. the world through your integral cinema, meta cinematrics technology. <laughs> Just through training enough new artists to be conscious of consciousness in their work. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much for joining us again. Thanks, Mark, for all this great work. It was a pleasure and an honor to work on this movie with you. Thank you, man. Thank you. And we will see you next time. Peace out.